Welcome back to Presidents in Politics. I am one of your hosts, Professor Kayla McGee, joined by my fellow co-host, former Congressman Ross. And today we have a we have a challenging topic. Yes. We're going to talk about our 23rd president, uh, Benjamin Harrison. And we booked it. We bookend him last time. We did. uh, He served right in between the two terms of Grover Cleveland. Yes. And uh, uh, probably a very uneventful um, president. (laughs) In, in so many ways. Yes. Uh, an unassuming man in a lot of ways. You and I have talked about this a lot. When we come through presidents, there's, there's those individuals you hit. If it's Washington, if it's Teddy Roosevelt, if it's Abraham Lincoln, we feel like we could do week-long series on these individuals. And then you hit a Benjamin Harrison, and it's like, you got about 15 minutes? Yeah. Let's talk about him. And, you know, the f- funny thing is, you know, his claim to fame, of course, is that his grandfather— Mm-hmm. served as president, William That's Henry correct. Harrison, but only served for a little over a month mm-hmm. before succumbing to pneumonia and dying. Because of his, what, like two and a half hour speech yeah, and in the bitter cold of D.C.? Yeah. There's something to be said about brevity. There he is. <laughs> I mean, there he is. You know. And then uh, ben- uh, Benjamin Harrison's father was a farmer, mm-hmm. but warned him of the, the perils of politics. And, suggested... and he had served in the House, his father yes, had. Yes. So very poli- But like you said, like, maybe he got a little bit of politics and didn't like, want nah, more. you don't want to do this. Yeah. And, but his wife, Carolyn, you know, encouraged him to go into it. Yes. And he had some setbacks. I mean, he lost. Uh, he tried to get nominated for governor of Indiana and mm-hmm. lost, and then he got nominated and then lost, uh, but then got appointed to the Senate. Um, mm-hmm. When Then when the Democrats took over the legislature in Indiana, he was summarily removed from the legis- from the Senate. So Overall, he seems like he was a pretty good guy. Um, yeah. he, he does everything he can. He's one of the first presidents outside of Lincoln to really try to push forward civil rights. He, he even was. A, he even appoints uh, Frederick Douglass as a minister to Haiti, and Douglass later writing about him will say that uh, he had never met a finer president. Yeah. Um, so he seems to be a, overall a pretty solid dude. I, I think he was solid. I think he was very matter of fact. You know, he very was a, he was a fact. Republican who uh, opposed the Chinese Exclusion he Act did. Uh, because he felt that the you know we had to uphold our treaties. And his with faith them. probably plays in this. He's, he's a yes. staunch Presbyterian. Yeah. Uh, loves the Lord. Talks about how prayers that guides his life. Days. So he's, he's, he seems to be. We talk good and great. He's not a great man. No, he's but not. But he's a good man. This is the opposite of Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson was a great man and not a good True. man. Benjamin Harrison is a good man. Man, but not really a great man. Yeah, and he's elected as president on the, on the centennial yes. of George Washington's election as president. Mm-hmm. And that's probably the worst, you know, uh, <laughs> comparison, to comparison make? you can have because yes. you look at, okay, we, and in fact, he even took the oath of office at, at Federal Hall in mm-hmm. New York mm-hmm. in order to uh, you know, replicate what, what was done 100 years ago, but there was just no comparison. No. Um, he had a few nicknames, and the one that always stuck to me is they called him the human iceberg hmm. because he was so... Yeah. Cold. And, and what they said about him was, and I, I've met a lot of people like this, and sometimes uh, professors, and I'm sure politicians are this way, they said that he was an amazing orator when he was with a crowd, but he had no personal one on one skills. Yeah, they said, yeah, that's what I read about him too. And they said yeah. he despised small talk, and that basically once the crowd was gone, he couldn't even talk to people. And I've known people like this, both pastors and, and professors, who just are amazing orators, but when you sit down to talk to them. No personal skills, yeah, interpersonal skills. I agree. And that could have been this guy, you know. He, he he was he was nominated for president on the eighth ballot. You know, I mean, here's a guy, and then he he campaigns from the front porch. From the front porch, the front porch politics. Now imagine that. Yes. Okay, let me, you've got people bring delegations to you <laughs> yes. so that you can campaign in front of them. Yes. I mean, that's just like. What a concept. Never yeah. have to leave the house. It's like delivery food, right? Yeah. I mean, just come on yeah. up. Yeah, door dash campaign. Yeah, exactly. You know? It's not, it doesn't sound that bad, actually. No. You save a lot of money on expenses. Yes. Let me just walk out the front door. And again, maybe this is where his his giftedness for oration came from. They the said people that, came to travel yes, to here. Yes. Yeah. But he had no interpersonal skills. And I think this is interesting. And, and I actually had this conversation with, with uh, a group of students. We were talking about political philosophy and Aristotle. And Aristotle says we're political animal. You're familiar with all that. Yes. And then he says that the highest form of politics is speech, actually, the ability to speak well. That's good. Um, and I think most politicians previously, I don't know if you can say that for the last several, but previously politicians were great orators. And if we stop and think about this idea, sometimes if you're if you're very gifted to speak in a room, for some reason there's a disconnect to that one-on-one level. And I'm sure you probably saw this a oh, lot yes. with, with politicians as well. I remember um, 
go into seminary with a guy who talked about uh, one of the individuals who was known as a very, very, very mega church pastor. And he would say, you know, when, when he was behind the pulpit, he was so charismatic and so on fire. And he said, but you would stand in the elevator with him and he'd stare at the wall because he's afraid he'd even look at you and talk to you. Isn't that amazing? Right? And, and this, I think this is kind of that Benjamin Harrison type yeah. of guy where he's just, a, he's so dynamic and charismatic in front of people, but one-on-one, he has no char- charismatic right. personality whatsoever. Um, so they caught him the human iceberg. Yeah. And then the other thing they called him, I thought this was interesting. He's only five, six. They called him yeah. Little Ben. Little Ben. Little Ben. And it was at his, I think it was his own party. He said he's big enough to wear his grandfather's hat, right? Yes. He had the same head size. Which... Tip of canoe and Tyler too. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, yeah, but you know, he was a he was a Civil War general and a, a pretty good one. Yeah. Cold, which again, that human, maybe that's where some of that comes from. He was a cold tactician. True. He didn't let emotion get in the way of True. anything. Um, Because he'll be involved in the Atlanta campaigns. Yes. He's one of the things that opens the door for Sherman to finish marching to the sea. Uh, And and he was awarded multiple times for for his valiant riding in in combat. Isn't Um, that amazing? Yeah, he starts as what, like a lieutenant? Yeah. And then he ends as a general, a one star. Um, so, I mean, he'll, he'll have a, a, a quick rise to military power. And he said that he saw his time serving in the Civil War as the pinnacle of his career, which, I mean, I guess with his presidency. Yeah, it might have been. <laughs> I mean, but, and it, you know, it, when he becomes president, he uh, sympathizes with the Civil War veterans. He does. To you know, almost an extreme degree and passes a pension bill for yes. the Civil War yes. uh, veterans. And it is such a boondoggle because... Uh, it allows for the the pensioners to have the pension passed on yes. to widows to to their widows, and they said that the, the seventy year old Civil War um, uh, veterans were marrying fourteen year old uh, girls so that they would have inherited eventually the, mm-hmm. the, the the ongoing pension, and it, it it almost bankrupt the nation. I was trying to find I wrote I thought I wrote it down, but I believe it was something like forty percent of the national budget at that time actually went to that that pension wow. plan. They say, I do know for a fact that under Harrison's time is the first time they passed a billion dollar budget. Right. Yeah, it was a billion dollar Congress, and the yeah, majority of that. Is, is the is the pension act which you feel so split on because I mean my lord our veterans I believe wholeheartedly oh, I we take care of them one hundred percent I don't think we do enough for our veterans and right. I think historically when you look at specifically certain conflicts specifically Vietnam and when these guys came home there there was there was no home reception and right. there was very little done for them at all rehabilitation you're correct whatsoever we what? had the, we had the GI bill and the VA you know that's uh, it. Of, um, administration to, to, to help them, but you're right. There was no, let's assimilate, assimilate you back into yeah. society. In fact, historically speaking, civil war, uh, excuse me, the, the Vietnam conflict was one of the few wars where there was no ho- welcome home parade. Oh, there was One of the not. reasons why is because they were brought home individually, usually on civilian flights, yeah. which was a horrible way of reintegration. Um, but furthermore than that, they were one of the only generation that was never celebrated. So when you look That's at Australia, true. they actually um, apologized, had an official parade, I think it was the 80s or 90s, and they had a welcome home parade. We've never done that. I always, I always tell my students, no. like, if you come to become president, the very first thing you do is you hold a parade for Civil War veterans and you show them our appreciation. Like, I don't care what else. That's the first thing you do. I agree. Um, Three of my brothers served in Vietnam, and they all would tell stories about it when they got came back stateside. They would change their out of their uniforms mm. in the restroom because they didn't want to be spit on. Mm. You know, it, 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 we did not treat the Vietnam veterans the way we should have. No. And 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 again, Benjamin Harrison, uh, being a military man himself, recognizes, you know, how important it is to preserve um, their their commitment uh, yes. with with a good pension, and does that. But he but he also he just he. I guess he gets he gets caught up because he he supports the tariff act, the McKinley Tariff <laughs> Act, which, when we think about this, it prohibited. Uh, the importation of, of foreign goods with a high tariff mm-hmm. so that we can uh, do more made in America. Right. And it was considered a consumer. Yes. But what we did actually is that we took away competition so that the American manufacturers mm-hmm. were had no competition so they could raise their prices, which didn't help the consumers, and then led to yes. these monopolies. Yes. You know, and then in return, he, he then passes the Sherman Antitrust <laughs> Act, and you wonder, well, this doesn't make any sense here. So was he just trying to placate everybody but not understand the or does he have no foresight and it's retroactive? Yes, very, that's very what good. I always wonder. Yeah. Like, it's almost like a guy who can't play chess, and it's like move. Oh, ch- no, counter move, counter move. Before long, to use the term, it's a fool's gambit. Before long, you're throwing pieces away yeah. because you could not have the foresight. And I don't know because they say he was very intelligent, but intelligence and wisdom and foresight are not the same thing. That's true. You know, there's one thing that I see, and, and we see talk about this a lot in politics, is the unintended consequences that's of our good. acts. And but but. But we are smart enough, and we've done so much that we can probably anticipate any consequence from any act that we take. Yes. And and I'm sure that if he's looking at how do you, we're going to stop the the importation of foreign goods and allow the Americans to. But but again, 
if you understand markets without competition, Absolutely. there's nothing that's going to drive the price down and increase the product better and, and, and benefit the consumer. So he was setting himself up, I think, for failure, which it ultimately it, it, it as someone who teaches political from. economy, which is one of my least favorite classes to teach, by the way, but um, <laughs> when I do teach political economy, I always have such mixed feelings about tariffs because I'm such an Adam Smith free market guy, and, and I, I'm I'm kind of Adam Smith all the way, but I'm I'm so big into to made in America products, right? Like if I oh, ever yeah. have the option, I'm going to pay a few dollars more and buy something made in America. Um, Adam Smith would argue, though, that tariffs would would destroy an economy. This is where you're going with this. And he would say, for example, if you as a country are good at something, manufacture what you're good at yes. and import from somewhere. And he would use the example of France in, in England. He'd be like, you know, for example, if if France is really, really good at growing pears, why would England take farmland and cultivate it, over fertilize and grow a couple pears so they could say it's grown in England and they're going to charge 10 times the amount when England could take that soil and grow something like roses or apples or something that they can grow well and then import your pears and then sell your apples back to France and make a profit. And this is where I go with, we don't have to put tariffs on everyone else. As Americans, we're good at doing some things. Yes. We're really good at steel. We're really good at, well, we're, we're really good at, <laughs> well, we're really good at aeronautics. We're really good at, my, there's a lot of right. things we're really good at that we still are on the positive of exporting. Why don't we focus and what we're good at, make a ton of American-made goods, but there are some things that we can bring about from a cheaper way. However, there's the ethics, of course, of sweatshops. We don't want to get into that. And That's Harrison true. hated this, and I don't know if you read this quote or not, but he said, I pity the man who wants a coat yeah. so cheap that that man or woman who produces the cloth will starve in the process. Yeah. And this is the ethical dilemma. And I always, I always we're cover having this. it today. Yes, when I cover political economy, we always cover this. What can we do to push forward American manufacturing without using tariffs? Because you know, government regulation never ends well. No. But at the same time, we don't want to have human rights violations. Right. And I'm sure in Congress you probably dealt with this a lot as well. Well, we do. We did. You know, the one thing, the axiom and the economic axiom is self-sufficiency breeds inefficiency. That's so if good. you're trying to do everything yourself, you're going to be very efficient about it. So you have to be able to have the trade. But, there, you know, the problem becomes how do you regulate the labor markets in these emerging markets, in yes. these emerging countries, these third world countries, especially when, when you have consumer demand that's just taking up everything that they're producing at a fraction of the actual market cost Absolutely. because of the free labor. You know, that's is a when we've been debating this ethical concern for some time we still have it today i would imagine most of the clothes that we all buy mm. are probably uh, prepared or manufactured by slave labor or you know very cheap labor uh, but that's the market you know, demanding it, it's just that there's no regulatory arm to prevent it in these third world countries. Yes. The boycott's the only way to do it. Absolutely. But are we that strong? Are we that, you know, um, disciplined that we could boycott everything made out of a third world country that's using slave labor or child labor? Yes. And, and like you said, there are, there are a few companies, I can think of a few companies that are trying to bring back American made goods for clothing and for boots and things of that nature. But a lot of times when you look at the prices, here's a pair of American made boots, it's $300. Here's a pair of boots that, you know, come from Walmart that were made in China. And they're twenty five bucks, right. right? So, like, where do I go on this? And that, that can be that can be a challenging thing. It is, right? It is, and especially for an individual who can't afford the three hundred dollar pair of boots. So now, what do I do? I want to support American made. I don't want to support sweatshops. It's a yeah. dilemma. It is a dilemma. It's a dilemma. And you made that statement too that self sufficiency breeds inefficiency. And that's and Adam Smith talks about this, right? Right. And I think is it Smith who, who used the example of pencil? And he uh, said, like, try making a pencil yeah. and you gotta grow the tree. And you cut your own wood and then you mine your own graphite. And then you you grow your own rubber trees and you produce the eraser and you have your own metal mill and you create the metal body. Before long, that pencil costs a thousand dollars. Yeah, I think it's, that was Milton Friedman that did okay, that. It's Friedman who yeah, does the pencil yeah. analogy. He yeah, was a huge Smith great, fan, right? Yes. Um, and Friedman free was market. amazing, by the way. Was. Uh, Chicago School of Economics, of yep. course. Um, but this whole idea of of how can we produce American-made goods that are still cost-effective and still protect human rights? And that's the age-old question. And this is it what is. Harrison was trying to explore, but he probably does it in a very poor way. You're right. And, and, and you know, unfortunately, you can't be isolationist either and no. expect to be able to, to, to have a, 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 a strong economy. You've got to have, you've got to have trade. Absolutely. And, and, and free trade is a misnomer. I mean, there's no such and thing as free class, trade. And I was in my class, I think you would agree with this. Again, from, from your time, I know you served a lot of international relations type committees. I think you'd agree with me in the sense that trade is the greatest source of economic and geopolitical security as well. It's what because, helped bring down the wall. Absolutely. When you're trading with someone, when you're making money off of another country, they don't want to invade you. No. And now when you're making a ton 
ton of money off you and you go, okay, I don't like what you're doing here with human rights or whatever. I'm going to start sanctioning you. Sanctions work. Yeah, well, I agree. They Sanctions work. work. So the more trade we have, the more safe we become and Absolutely. the more influence we have. Uh, economic policies are so much more effective than military strategies. Every time. You know, military strategies should be a last resort. But you look at, again, you know, and during the Cold War, there were no Levi jeans or anything in Russia. They, yeah. that, that, what did they have? The Treblinka, whatever the car was over there that, you know, you would you wait six years to get. <laughs> yes. All of a sudden, the consumer demand starts building because we're starting to slowly infiltrate our, our way into East, uh, Eastern Europe. And, and, and the, 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 the Europeans, the Eastern Europeans are saying, we don't want no, any more of this yeah, socialist absolutely. society. We want capitalism. Absolutely. And, and Yeah, I love that you brought the car. Ronald Reagan tells the story. It was, it was 10 years yeah. in the Soviet Union. It was 10 years so, in the Soviet Union. And you had to pay up front. You bought up front the, your money. You bought your car. And it was a 10-year wait list before your car was delivered that you already paid for. Right. So Ronald Reagan tells the story because he loved his Soviet <laughs> Union jokes. I don't know if you've heard this or not. <laughs> about the gentleman who, who finally saved up enough money. He was a businessman in Russia, if there, if there was such a thing at this time. He buys his car, 10-year wait list. And they go, okay, comrade, here's the money. 10 years from now, we'll deliver your car. And the gentleman looked back at the car salesman. He said, is it the morning or the afternoon? <laughs> and the car salesman goes, why does that even matter? It's 10 years from now. And he said, well, the plumber's coming in the afternoon. <laughs> and that's what economics cause when you start having too much right. government sanctions. Right? We want a free market, but we right. also want to protect human value. And this is where Benjamin Harrison's coming from. Yes. How do we do both? How do we balance that? And, and we still I, haven't figured it out. No. And, and unfortunately, I think he got it. But then again, you know, while he was in the White House, his wife, Carolyn, gets stricken with tuberculosis, yes. Yes. which adversely impacts his ability to, to run for reelection. Um, and she dies, mm -hmm. you know, just before the uh, the reelection, uh, and and unfortunately, both she dies and he does not win his reelection, and he loses to Grover Cleveland, mm -hmm. whom he beat mm -hmm. four years before. And you brought this up in our last podcast, but I love the civility of Grover Cleveland. Yeah, that when Benjamin Harrison can no longer campaign, Cleveland like civilly bows out and says, "Well, I won't campaign and run against you either." Basically, out of respect for your your dying yeah. wife, we'll both just sit out the last few months. And I love that. And I think about that level of civility. Can we ever see that again in, in, in politics? Like ever see that level of just civility and mutual respect for human beings? I wish being? I knew. I, you know, I, I remain very optimistic, but absent getting good people involved in this process that have mm -hmm. that tendency to want to practice that civility and respect for their, for their opponent, mm -hmm. uh, I don't see it happening. And, you know, but it can change. I don't think it's going to change before the election of 2024. No. But we'll see. He did do a few, I guess we can use the term beneficial things in his yes. presidency. One of the things he also, again, these are, these are such contemporary issues. I feel like with Benjamin Harrison, we're kind of derailing some of the history. We're just handling contemporary issues. He also wanted to, to deal with the immigration issue, and he forms Ellis Island. I don't, yes. know, I don't know if you're familiar with this or not, but he is the president who forms Ellis Island. The reason why is because immigration up until this point, everyone just kind of came in wherever they wanted. He's like, no, we need a centralized We spot. need a point of entry. We can vet this. We can make huh. sure these are... <laughs> What an idea. <laughs> we can vet this. We can make sure that people are actually who they say they are. We record a, a log of who's coming in, their family. All this in Ellis Island it, it is founded on the belief and the principle that immigrants do make America greater, but they are still should be controlled and secured. What a concept. <laughs> I agree. Do we, and, and I guess this is one – again, he's not an interesting president, honestly. But there's, it's, it's amazing how these issues are the same ones today. This is not changed. It's no. immigration. It's economics. Uh, it's environmental. He also mm -hmm. one of the very first start, uh, na national parks. And then Teddy Roosevelt jumps on this, and you know he really, oh. with his friendship with John Muir, they really start building the, the federal park system. Um, but he'll he'll uh, reserve 22 million acres of national forest. Wow, I didn't realize that. One of the largest. And then also he also did set a record. He is the most uh, annexation state president. Six states he'll annex. Uh, in the West. So, I mean, he, That's right. He did. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, uh, Montana, South Dakota, North South Dakota, North Dakota, Idaho, uh, Idaho, Washington, and Washington. I think yeah. that's right. That sounds right. Anyway. Wow. So I mean, he, he did a few things. Yeah, he was aggressive there. He also had the Pan American Conference. Yes, he wanted the Panama Canal, right? Yes, he way did. before his time. Yep, and he um, he strengthened the Navy. Mm -hmm. so. uh, what was it? I wrote this down as well because he was the first twenty four steel ships in the Navy. Which was huge at that yeah. time period. And again, if you talk modern issues, our Navy has now fallen behind. It's no longer the large. Well, we can't. We can't. We can say the most yeah. powerful, but we're no longer the largest naval power in the world. So these are all such content. The, the issues haven't changed. No, they have not. The issues haven't changed. No, they have not. Maybe I we need a Benjamin Harrison again. I mean, <laughs> uneventful, but he strengthens the Navy. He takes care of immigration. He tackles the economy. Yeah. Just somebody take care of immigration, immigration, please. Benjamin Harrison for 2024. There you go. 
Um, but he does, he does have some interesting aspects. And we talked a little bit uh, about his faith, but he is a man uh, of very strong faith. Yes, he is. Uh, Presbyterian. He became a deacon in 1857 and an elder in 1861, taught Sunday school. One of his biographers wrote this about him. Harrison believed firmly that the end of all human activity is to serve God and to take personal comfort in prayer. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. He, he seems to be not bad advice at all. He said this about himself as, as he came to the end of his life. He wrote a book called, I don't remember what it was called, the, uh, something about the ex-presidency, Tales from a President, whatever it was. Um, and he made this statement, prayer steadies one when he's walking in slippery places, even if things asked for are not given. Mm. I like that. Prayer steadies one. And you can almost kind of hear like uh, that old general in him, right? As he's like riding like yeah. steady, steady. Yeah. Prayer steady's one. And this guy's seen combat. He's been in the White House. I mean, he should be more interesting than what he is. I hate to say that, but like, can you imagine this guy's been a general? He's fought in the Civil War. He's been a president. I feel like he should be that cool guy who tells stories, but he's not. Well, he also lost the popular vote. Yes, he does. So, so I mean, when he gets elected president, he doesn't win the popular vote, but he That's wins right. the electoral vote. So you, the, the, you can tell he's already got issues going into it. Mm-hmm. You know, if he can't, yeah, of course, that might be, the, again, the front porch Is campaign. it a lack of charisma, maybe? Could be. I, a, a great orator, but not... From from your relate. experience in D.C., how much does charisma play into politics? Significantly, yeah. Especially in the social media age that we have today. Oh, I'm sure. You know, I mean, the 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 uh, the, the emotional debate always seems to prevail over the intellectual <laughs> debate yes. because of the charismatic way in, in, in it may be delivered mm. by the the, the 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 orator. I remember I had a, a professor one time who taught uh, rhetoric and, and and debate. He made the statement. He and I thought this was so powerful. And I think about this a lot in my own life. Just because you win an argument doesn't mean you're right. Sometimes you're just a better debater. Very well put. How, and I, I've thought about it in my own life. Like sometimes you can use your charisma and your own skill. And I, I thought back and I'm like, how many arguments did I even win that I wasn't right on? Right? Like, and how many have I lost? You know, they, but like how, tr- how true is that? Just because you win an argument doesn't mean you're right. Absolutely. Sometimes you're just really good at playing the rhetoric game. <laughs> right? And I think that's a big part of politics. Oh, it is. Uh, it absolutely how is. How you frame the narrative. And then yeah. how how solid you and whose are. Whose fault is that? Oh, is it is goodness. it is it those that are listening that mm. they didn't do their research or didn't Good. do their their due diligence on you, or is it you for knowing you could take advantage of them? You know, I mean, there's a it's the political process. Yeah, right? critical thinking's been lost, right, it from has, the individual. We don't teach it. No, no, not, not not at all. I mean, I read it online, so it must be true. Yep. Here's a quote that I, I think you're gonna like. This is this is one of my favorites. He talked about the power of the presidency. Um, he said two presidents or three with equal powers, would as surely bring disaster as three generals of equal rank in a command of a single army. I do not doubt that the, the sense of a single responsible individual to the people strongly held our presidency to a good conscience and to high discharge of their duties. And I like this. And he said, basically, when you hold the office of president, you are holding it above other offices. And that sense of responsibility makes you live higher, should make you live higher. And he said, if we were to split this up, and I, we hear this all the time. We had this in a, in a class not too long ago, if you remember, we were mm-hmm. teaching. And it's like, well, just take the office of president and split between like three or four individuals. And here's Harrison. He's like, that would no, never work. Of course it wouldn't work. Right? The Romans tried that, the triumvirate, right? Yeah. Having three major leaders. <laughs> it, it doesn't work. No. Um, what, are your, what are your thoughts on this from someone who, again, has served in, in, in D.C. and seen this? There has to be a central command. Hmm. There has to be. That's hmm. the only way things flow. Otherwise, they're played against each other. <laughs> and that is a disastrous result. Hmm. You know, uh, and I, I have to give him credit on recognizing that. And I think most of the people that we've discussed as presidents have identified that once they get in that yeah. role, that it's a trust. And it's a very, very um, sacred trust that they hold for the American people. Absolutely. And they, you know, they, they understand that it takes somebody to be able to make a decision and then move on. And then face the consequences exactly. of that decision. Because if they don't like the decision, the whole beauty of the American system is then we vote you out. Yeah. Right? Like, it, it's almost like, and you, you've had this as well, when, when you take a job, like, let me do my job. And then if you don't let the, res- the results, then you can fire me. Right? Exactly. But let me make the decisions. Let me make the calls for it's what you call me to do. Be. Right? And then I will stand on my own merit. If you don't like the way it's going, fire me. And that's the whole entire principle of the presidency is vote this individual in, let them make their decisions. And if you don't like it, get them out. 
Yeah. And that's the beauty of the American system. I agree. I mean, you can delegate authority. You can't delegate responsibility. That's and right. If you have co-leaders, uh, then you're starting to get into the responsibility issue. With, they're responsible because they were, that's you know, right. no, there's only one person that's responsible, and that's you. That's right. You can delegate your authority, but you are ultimately the responsible that's one. That's right. That's right. So as we look at this life of Benjamin Harrison, not spectacular. No. In any way, you and I have said this throughout a lot of the podcasts. Leaders many times are average or below average. Yeah. That's Harrison. Yeah. But overall, he was a solid dude. Light years ahead in civil rights. Really solid with environmental. Really great for, for reaching out and trying to take care of veterans. Oh, yeah. Trying to help fix the economy. Trying to fix immigration. Trying um, to he, annex Hawaii. Try to annex Hawaii. Uh, annex in five, five or six states. I mean, he does yeah. a lot of good stuff. He's just not charismatic how he does it. No, he's not. But again, maybe, maybe, maybe we're viewing this from our time where we always want a rock star president. Maybe we don't need a rock star president. Maybe we just need someone who has some common sense policies. You're right. Just a good placeholder. Let's stop the popularity contest for the rock star presidents. (laughs) Right. And let's find someone who can just do some good common sense things. Yes. Benjamin Harrison, 2024. You're on. (laughs) Thank you very much. This has been an interesting one. Yes, it has. Short.